Good morning. Good morning. And for the second time, I wish you a Happy New Year. I did that at the beginning of Advent because that's the beginning of the Christian year. And now the rest of the world is caught up with us. So it is a nice day and a new year. Let's begin with the call to worship. The one who knows, the one who sits on the throne said, And now I make all things new. You began this year confident in your power. You made the heavens and the earth. They will end. But you, O oh Lord, will endure. You are the same forever. Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord, who made all things, who is faithful forever. The Lord is our past, our present, and our future. Something that I came across some time ago was a quotation from E. Stanley Jones. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that name. He was a world-famous missionary who did most of his work in India, but also became world-known because of his writings and his witness. He said, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. What an excellent thought for a new year. Let's stand and join in our opening carol, one that celebrates this special Christmas season. <laughs>
is a celebration that we enjoy at Christmas time, but in spirit we take forward. Would you join with me in that uh, part about the Advent candles you find in your bulletin? The candles on the Advent ring are a witness of persons waiting for the promise of Christmas to come more fully into our world. And in ancient times we have needed the light, the gift of Christ offers, it proclaims God's love. With them the world can find hope and peace, because we know God is with us. Though we extinguish the candles for light, love, hope, and peace, we know their spirit lives because the Christ candle remains. God's power continues to move our world closer to the kingdom Jesus spoke of. And we join in the first verse of the carol while shepherds watch. Sometimes you're making me think this is a bit off the same subject in a way, but uh, sometimes when we go back and look at what we've done, uh, it reminds me of something my sister used to say on occasion when we would point out something that, well, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to us. <laughs> and she might say, well, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> sometimes we look back at some of the things that we've done with that kind of a uh, well, is that an excuse? Whatever. Well, let me invite you to join with me in a little time of silent prayer and meditation, and then we'll join together as a congregation. God, a 
as we come, we give thanks for a year that is past, filled with so many different experiences, ones in which we can look back and see the value of the church, the value of faith. We can see your hand in so many different things. We give thanks that as we went through that year, sometimes there were questions we knew that at all times you were with us. And now we begin a new year and we give thanks for the opportunities that it presents. It is like new fallen snow in many ways, untouched, untracked. And it presents to us a challenge of the trails and tracks that we will leave in that year that we have just begun. As we go forward, we know that you will continue to be with us, that your great gift that comes with Christ is that promise that he is with us, that we are not alone in this world. That is one of the great gifts that you've given us in the church. That we are bound together with so many others in this congregation, in the churches beyond this, in the church around the world. We are tied together by a common faith. And we give thanks for that incredible gift. And now as we continue in this service, we give thanks for each one here as we begin this journey together and ask your grace and your peace for all. Be with those who are sick, those who are ill. Be with those who have spent this very special time of the year far from home. Be they there because of the work that they are involved in, those who are representatives of the church, those in service of nation, be with each one, and may you bring us all together once again. These things we ask in Christ's name, who came and called people to himself, twelve followers, and then as he began the ministry through those followers called all to himself. And we are part of that. The one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we seem to be a little short on children, so I think we will do that next time around.
And then he sent them to Bethlehem with these instructions. Go and make a careful search for the child, and when you find him, let me know so I too may go and worship him. And so they left. And on their way they saw the same star they had seen in the east, and when they saw it, how happy they were, what joy was theirs. It went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And they went into the house. And when they saw the child with his mother Mary, they knelt down and worshipped him. And they brought out their gifts of gold, frankincense, myrrh, and presented them to him. And they returned to their country by another road, since God had warned them not to go back to Herod. We have a picture in our mind of the visitors. We know where they came from. We know how long they traveled. We, we know how, uh, well, the fact that uh, we know their names, we know the gifts, uh, we know a great deal about them, and that all is a kind of a picture in our mind when we hear those stories or see a representation like what's on the front of the bulletin of the journey of the wise men. But the truth is, they're really a mystery. A mystery that's only lifted in a few short paragraphs. And what we do know about them, well, not very much. We don't know where they came from. We don't know their names. We have, uh, at least legend has assumed they rode camels, but we don't know. We don't know if they traveled over endless wastes or through cities and towns. We don't know what dangers they might have faced. We don't know what hardships they must have overcome. We don't know if they got discouraged along the way. We don't know if they traveled for days or weeks or even months. We don't know when they started. We don't know where they went back to. They are a mystery that simply enters the history of the world, comes out of the mists, and then goes back into the mists, and are heard from no more. The one thing that the story of the wise man does bring up for certain is the fact that uh, there's a great deal of difference between the reactions of those who, who knew of the birth. There was Herod. Herod was king. He'd been king for a long time. Herod was a, well, he had, had, was king longer in that part of the world than anyone else. He had uh, been able somehow to keep the peace. He'd been able to, to pacify, I guess is the right word, the Jewish people who were always ready to revolt against Rome because they considered their only true ruler to be God. And so there was always this simmering possibility of a revolt against a foreign invader. Herod had been able to play off and to pacify, and well, he had been very successful, let's put it that way. He'd been a, a, a great builder. He'd been generous at times with his own wealth. He was a very successful king in, in most people's books. But Herod had a few faults, and one of those was his insane... Uh, well, he was king for a long time, and he did not ever want to give up that power. And so anyone who was a possible rival for his position was in grave danger. As a result, at least one wife was killed. Several of his sons were killed. Other relatives were killed. Anyone who threatened Herod's power was in grave danger of his life. And so when Herod heard that there possibly was a new king, their only result.
result would be his attempt to destroy that person. And if it was a baby, it made it that much easier. And if you didn't know which baby, then you just dealt with all of them the same way. There were others, though, who, who knew. There were the chief priests. There were the scribes. They, they knew they had the knowledge of where the birth was to take place, according to the scriptures. But to them, it was irreverent. They really didn't care. They had the knowledge, but it made no difference to them. And there was another reaction, as you know, in that story. It was the reaction of those who, who came to honor, and yes, even to worship. They sensed that something incredibly important happened, and they reacted. Now, it says the obvious that Jesus wasn't born in the hometown of the wise men. They had to choose to travel. They had a choice of what to do with the information that they thought they saw in the stars. Uh, the shepherds, after they had received a message that something stupendous had happened in the little village next, just outside of where they were, said, let's go and see what has happened that we've been told about. They had a choice. As you read the story, the Christmas story, you come to the point of knowing that everyone in it has a choice, that God never forced anyone into anything that is true of us as well. One could say one thing for certain, that the journey of the wise man was against common sense. Those who were practical people stayed home. Common sense, well, you might say common sense it is in kind of short supply in the Bible in many ways. Common sense would say that Jesus should remain a carpenter in Nazareth. He should forget about preaching. And if he has to speak out, he should never say much of anything that would attract his attention, attract the attention of the authorities. And for certain, you would never want to say anything that would offend them. Common sense would say that the disciples, well, they could be interested bystanders of hearing Jesus but if he ever invited them to follow, well, they should simply remember all of their responsibilities to, to family and to community and to, to their professions. They should consider those things instead. Common sense would have said to the early Christians, if you're caught, give up your faith. At least say you have and spare your life. Common sense would say to any missionary, possible missionary, stay home and, and do all those things that normal people do. Common sense would say to anyone who would give time and energy and resources, keep it all for yourself. And yet if common sense reigned, in this world, there would be no, no message about a Jesus. There would be no reason to remember him. There would be no church. There would be no faith. There would be a world that would be infinitely darker because of the influences of all those who have been lost. <coughs> wise men, or those we call the wise men, came. They brought gifts. But the greatest gift that they gave 
was the gift of their coming. If you think about gifts that are given, it is usually not so much the gift, but it is the person behind it and what they have done to present the gift that makes it most important. As we think about Christmas, as we think about some of the traditions of it, most, one of the most strong traditions of all is the giving of gifts. And it begins with God's giving the gift of Himself. Because the gift God gave at Christmas was the gift of coming and being a part of this world with us. The gift that we can give is our coming to Him. Amen. one 
verse, the refrain only, one, bob, one bread, one body. The invitation that was given to those disciples all those many years ago has been extended and shared in by countless Christians ever since that time. And we too, as we begin this new year, share in that communion which began 
in that little room up over at home in Jerusalem. that he gave so long ago extends to us and to Christians all over the world. sometimes printed the last song in the, in the bulletin, as you noticed that uh, there probably wasn't room with all the other things I had there, but uh, let me read to you just that last verse, which I thought I had marked. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And that has been the challenge of the church from its very beginning. So as we begin a new year, we go out with that challenge before us to live and to speak of that one we call Jesus the Christ. Amen. May your new year be a great one.